Thank you very much. Is this on? Hooray, it is. Right, let's talk about self-driving cars. I am obsessed with self-driving cars. I'm really into them. And not just because I'm writing a book about what the horseless carriage can tell us about the driverless car. Well, that is one reason I'm interested in them, but, uh, but it's kind of cause and effect. I'm writing the book because I'm so obsessed. So I'm really delighted that we have three people to discuss what's going on with driverless cars. Uh, and they are, I'm going to start at that end, Stan Boland, who's the CEO of 5AI, uh, Leslie Notabom, who is the co-founder and chief product officer at Humanizing Autonomy, and Kirsty Lloyd-Dukes from Latent Logic. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk to them briefly individually, so if you're not familiar with them and their companies, you can find out what they're doing, and then we're going to open it up to discussion. And then are we doing Q&A as well? I don't know. What's the format been here? No, we're not, apparently. Also, I don't seem to have a timer. Oh, well, never mind. I'll live. You're my timer. Okay, the human timer is here. Right, Stan, let's start with you. Um, for people who are not familiar with 5AI, tell us what it does. So we're building a full stack, uh, software stack for uh, urban mobility. Um, so our company is, uh, today it's about 150 people. And um, we're particularly focused on uh, developing and uh, verifying that stack in European cities. Um, and we, we can maybe talk later about yeah, why that's different. Okay, excellent. So you're just to just to put you in terms of your peers, you're building the self-driving car system. You're not building like an operating system for cities or a ride-hailing marketplace. This is the stuff that goes in the car. Yeah, it's the if you like it, the, the output is a kind of runtime stack that runs on the vehicle uh, in, in a, on a very large stack of compute, and we we essentially take the output of sensors. We we actually specify what sensors we want on a vehicle. We take the output of those sensors and we process all that data um, through a whole series of different um, modules and we end up delivering instructions to the steering, the acceleration, the braking, the signals of the car in order to sort of allow the car to be controlled safely in a complex urban environment. Uh, so Sebastian Thrun once put it beautifully, he said that really the output of the self-driving system is whether you go lefter, righter, faster or slower. And when you think about it like that, it sounds really simple, but actually it's a total nightmare. So, uh, so and then just to put you in context with your sort of industry peers, you're, you want to be like, what, the Android for self-driving cars? You want to license the whole technology stack to car makers? You're like Aurora, someone like that? Yeah, I get, I, uh, yeah we, we don't have the capital of any of those guys. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so um, but, uh, and, and I have to say, we are going to have to find our place in the kind of ecosystem here. Um, that um, yeah, w what's possible to do in the US and maybe possible to do in China is, is today, I, I don't really think is quite possible to do yet in Europe really. And, and in Europe, we're definitely gonna uh, be adopting a much more partnered strategy for how we bring this technology to market. Um, so whether that means uh, it's a license or whether it means it's a partnership and revenue share or whatever, it's gonna certainly involve us delivering you know, some of the core component technologies for self-driving um, in partnership with other people that can do the other elements of the whole Excellent. Thing. Well, that's a beautiful setup for our other two panelists who are doing uh, other elements as well. So, Leslie, tell us exactly what Humanizing Autonomy does. Yeah, so uh, Humanizing Autonomy, we're building uh, the global standard for how people and machines interact. And the way that we've done that for now is we, we built a computer vision uh, software platform that allows you to understand the full breadth and diversity of pedestrian behavior. Uh, so what we do is we recognize and we predict different ways in which pedestrians all over the world behave so that the car can then use that information to drive more safely or more efficiently through dense urban areas where at the moment these cars are not being driven. They're driven through Silicon Valley or through Phoenix, Arizona. There are no people that walk over there. Okay, we're going to get onto the, the challenges of getting cars to drive themselves in Europe in a moment, I think. But just to be clear, you just said how people and machines interact. This is a machine, I'm a human. You're talking about machines with wheels that go along streets in particular, right? You're not it's not a general technology about human intent in other ways. The, the, the total vision is that everything that has a camera should understand how people okay. behave to interact with them better. Our first target is the automotive industry. So we're currently in advanced driver assistance systems of cars that are being driven by people. Right. Uh, we're in autonomous vehicles that make decisions based on what they can see through their sensors. Uh, but we're also in more close off environments like manufacturing. So industrial robots, that kind of, is that person about to step in the path of that robot kind yep. of stuff? Yep. And um, uh, uh, does that, it sounds like you've got this stuff out and you know, live it already. So what, does someone like Mobileye use your technology? 
Um, not yet. Okay. Soon. Who does then? Who, which car um, can I buy that has this in it? So there, there are a couple of partners that we work with. Uh, so both uh, automotive manufacturers. So for example, we work with Daimler, Mercedes-Benz. Um, we've also worked with Airbus uh, in, in, in other applications of the technology. Right. Um, so there, the, yeah, it's in use there. Okay, now I think people are used to the idea of facial recognition systems that do kind of emotion and you, they say like happy, sad, angry, you know, might be a criminal or whatever. I don't know what, what they're trying to get them to do these days. But you're, you're being like the next level of what are they, are they about to step in the road? Are they daydreaming? Are they walking one way, looking another way? That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So at the moment, what most of these uh, perception stacks are able to do is to detect a person. So they see, oh, there's a person over there. The person might be in the path of the vehicle yep. or not, and then the vehicle responds. But they just end up being a kind of, here's a yellow box, and there's a person yeah. in it. Yeah, they're bounding boxes. So we look into the bounding box to see what the person's actually doing. Are they distracted? Where are they going to go to in the future? And create a probability so that the vehicle can then either warn the driver or take a decision itself. But okay. safer than without it. And does this include cyclists? Includes cyclists. It does include yeah. cyclists, because that's... All vulnerable road users. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Excellent. Kirsty, come to you. So tell us about Latent Logic and what it does. Sure, of course. Well, uh, nice to be here. Hello, everybody. Uh, so uh, I guess we're a bit different. Uh, we are not making anything at all that goes on a self-driving car. So not making self-driving cars at all. Uh, but we're focusing on actually the big problem that I think everyone here as a consumer, as a potential driver of a self-driving car or user of one of these robot taxis is worried about, which is how on earth do you know that they're safe? So we build test environments, simulated virtual reality test environments, which you can use to test a self-driving car and make sure that it's safe. Okay, so you're using something like a Grand Theft Auto gaming engine, and that means you know what everything is in the world. You don't have to label it and have like people in India applying labels because the engine knows what it all is. Yep. Is that really realistic enough to uh, Sebastian through it again? He, I remember him saying that the, um, when they first tested Google's perception system, it thought that a paper bag blowing across the road was a flying baby. Mm -hmm. So I mean, aren't there these kind of weird edge cases? And, and can you really capture that in simulation? Another one is um, the man in the chicken suit. Who's the, who's the guy from autonomy? Uh, sorry, new, new autonomy. He, I remember him saying they were testing in Singapore. There was a guy in a chicken suit standing by the road and the perception system was like, what the hell is that? So how do you deal with the weirdness of the, every, of the real world? Yeah, well actually simulation is one of the best ways to deal with the weirdness of the real world. Uh, because actually you cannot, if you're just trying to drive a car around to test if it's safe, then you can do millions and millions of miles but not encounter any of those weird situations. Whereas in simulation you can recreate them. You but how do you know which are the weird, si I mean have you got, have you got man in chicken suit? Is that part of your model? That I mean is one of the things you can simulate. It is? Okay. Um, so we specifically focus on interactions between ca the car, the autonomous car, and other humans on the road. So whether that's drivers, cyclists, or pedestrians, trying to look at those sort of dangerous, difficult interactions, uh, the kind of things that we as normal drivers find difficult, yep. and replaying that in simulation to make sure the autonomous car is dealing with it in a safe way. Now, paper bag on the road is another classic one. Is it a breeze block? Will it destroy the suspension, or is it just a paper bag? And again, you see this twice a year as a normal driver. Is that? Is, but that's out of scope for you. That's not. We tend to focus more on the interactions between humans and the autonomous vehicle, and specifically looking at is the autonomous vehicle making the right decisions. Right. So when it's seen a, a car about to merge in front of it, is that car actually going to merge in front or not? Should I slow down? Should I go quicker? And that's the kind of thing that's really important to test in simulation. And if you imagine you're building an autonomous car, and uh, indeed as Stan will know, right? When you're developing the software, you have to keep testing it. It's not like you just build one version of the software and you ship it. You have anything like your iPhone, it's being updated constantly. And that means you have to test it every single time. And you can't just drive it out on the road. Okay. You've got to test in simulation. So who are your who are your customers using this? Can you say who any of them are? Um, so I can't tell you about any of our customers. I can tell you about two really exciting projects we're working on, which is actually funded in part by industry and in part by the UK Department for Transport. And they're actually working with insurers like Admiral Insurance, uh, with some uh, AV developers like Arrival, to come up with a framework to certify a self-driving so car. So this is a sort of driving test for self-driving exactly cars. Exactly, so you stole my line. Uh, well, <laughs> I think the Singaporean government stole your line. But, um, Meanies. No, the B Boston do this as well, right? Yeah. So where, yeah. else, where else do they actually make you make a self-driving car do a driving test in order to before it can go on the road. So the thing is really cool is no one has actually worked out how to do that yet. So Singapore is quite advanced. They've put together some straw man regulations. The US is quite far behind in the sense that, as you've probably seen, there's a lot of controversy about how autonomous cars should be But tested. it's a patchwork, isn't it? I mean, some bits of the US are a bit more 
laissez-faire, shall we say, than others. So True, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think what we're really looking for in the UK is how can you come up with a framework that the public can trust, that insurers can trust, because these guys have to carry the cost at the end of the day, but also that is acceptable to automakers around the world. Because we know, as you represented right. the UK economy, we really want people to develop and test and drive self-driving cars here. And to be, to be clear, the driving test would take place in simulation. So you would be able to throw thousands of edge cases at a self-driving system and see how it responds. Is that how it works? Yep. So it'll start off in simulation, do thousands of edge cases in simulation. Waymo, we've talked about them earlier, they do 8 million miles in simulation every yep. single day. You'd then do some tests in a controlled environment, like a test track, which is kind of how cars are tested today. And then once you'd pass those, you'd then also have some real world tests as well. So it's really a kind of belt and braces approach. Okay, I think we've got the general picture then. So trying to do everything, focusing on pedestrian intent and simulation so we can tell whether these things are safe or not. So I'd like to kind of um, open up more broadly and ask all of you for your take on, I think, you know, most people outside this business would think, well, you know, the enthusiasm for autonomous cars has, has declined a bit, particularly since the, uh, the Uber accident in Tempe. Um, but just generally, these vehicles don't seem to be as making as much progress as they were. How does it feel inside the industry? Do you see the rate of progress slowing down? Do you see the enthusiasm level changing? Stan, what's your take? Uh, well, I think, I think the world's realized it's a really hard problem. Um, so um, every single aspect of what we have to develop, it turns out to be a very, very hard uh, problem. So you know, things like uh, how good do you think we are at perception? Uh, how good are we at detecting cyclists and pedestrians and cars and trucks and men with chicken suits or whatever? Um, uh, and it turns out uh, yeah, the state of computer science is the answer to that is probably not very good. Um, so you look at you know, the error rate, you know, the number of times you have a false positive or false negative, um, of uh, objects in a scene on a single frame, and with a lot of uh, data management, we can maybe get to one error in 10 to the three, um, but human driving, we've got to be more like um, one error in 10 to the seven. Depends obviously on how we take those decisions. So we're four orders of magnitude away from where we need to be to be safe. Um, and how so quickly is that change? Because I think it's the it's the rate of change rather than that. We know this is hard, but y are you getting exactly. closer? So, so it, 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 it can be done by brute force or it can be done by intelligence. Um, and, and, and I think what we're doing at 5AI is we're applying intelligence to that problem because obviously you know, what's out in the world is a very, very long latent tail of surprises out there. So you described some of them before. Um, and uh, we, we, yeah, we can't sit at a desk and invent th what the world looks like. We've actually got to go out and discover it. Um, so you know, there has to be a big program of domain analysis to go out and capture what is in the real world. And then we have to be able to take that back and we've got to be able to turn it into generalized learning somehow. And that you know, piece by piece, uh, we want to be able to train our system and develop our system so that next time it sees something that looks a bit like that, there's a generalized solution to it and it doesn't make the same mistake. Um, so it, it's that, so that, is, that requires a very, very efficient way of capturing data in the real world. And it also requires a very, very efficient way of, of building a pipeline of technologies that allow you to turn that into an improved runtime stack. So um, while you're doing all this, are you more or less optimistic about, how, about solving this problem than you were, say, a year ago? Um, well, I, I think we understand the problem much better. Um, yeah, we, we certainly as a company do. Um, yeah, we are, I mean, yeah, there's, no, there's no hiding that Europe is in catch-up mode with a lot of this stuff. Um, that if you look at the 20 billion that's been spent in the US right now, um, yeah, th there's no question there's 15 years worth of know-how in some of those companies. In Europe, we are definitely, definitely in catch-up mode, and that definitely has r caused us to go through trial and error in the process of learning how to solve these problems. So I think we've certainly been through the first two or three cycles of trial and error, and I think we're on a much, much better track for solving those issues now. And, and I would say we, we believe we have ways of doing this that will be more effective, less capital intensive, and more reliable than U.S. counterparts, and that has to be where we play oh, as, feisty, as a region. The feisty European startup. Okay, we'll get to we'll get to the kind of difference in the environment in a minute. Leslie, what's your take on the um, the kind of general sentiment in the in the self-driving car sector? Yeah, I feel like it's uh, maturing a lot um, in a couple of ways. So first of all, the people that uh, we worked with, let's say two years ago, even described the whole autonomous space as being the wild west. You just try something, you see if it works. Um, but now we feel like the companies that are contacting us are actually, they understand what we're building and they understand how they could use it. 
So I feel like in that way it's becoming much more realistic because the companies that want to use these kind of technologies have educated themselves and understand how they could apply it in their industry or in their application. Okay, and what about the maturity of as a, as a business? So this idea that companies like yours provide these point solutions that are integrated by other companies. Everyone's kind of got their head around which bit of the stack they're playing in. Is that clearer than it was? Um, yeah, yeah, and I think what, what's, what's great, actually what, what Stan also uh, described is that now that companies have realized how difficult it is to really create these type of technologies, they're starting to understand that they can't do everything. Right. And they'll need to work with companies like ours to and be able to achieve and, and does work with include acquire? Because there does seem to be quite a lot of sort of consolidation on the horizon here. Do you, do you see that things going that way? Well, you see it happening in the market. Um, I, I guess so, yes. I think like that was was actually really exciting is the standardization of these types of technologies. So um, basically now companies are comparing technologies to one another based on data sets that they right. train or that they test all the companies that might offer a similar solution um, to to them. So basically now they actually understand how they can compare different partners to work with to actually evaluate how good they are and not just based on that we say that we're 99% accurate. And, and that's actually, come to think of it, what happens with other car parts, isn't it? I mean, if you want to measure the performance of a brake pad or a spark plug, you don't, you know, you don't just want to trust one company to tell you that theirs is really good. You want to actually be able to compare them. Uh, Kirsty, what's your take on the sentiment of the business? So I think that um, undoubtedly, look, some of the hype has cooled down, but I think people are approaching a kind of realistic but positive stage. I think what we've seen is actually everyone in the industry is trying to break down the problem and make it simpler in two ways. The first one, exactly what my partners on the panel said, which is around partnering. So looking for um, specific parts of the ecosystem in which to play, not trying to solve all the problems themselves. I think the other one that's really exciting and optimistic is around looking for simple and more defined use cases. So rather than saying, I'm going to be total autonomy everywhere from my village to London, totally autonomous. Which is nonsense, because humans <laughs> don't even, I mean, humans are not level five drivers, right? I mean, I won't drive in, in Delhi, and my wife won't drive in the dark, because she's got <laughs> bad eyes. So she's, we both fail at being level five right I there. won't drive in London, so there you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, so people are trying to break down the problem. So looking at specific use cases, so whether it's on a university campus, if it's around a retirement village, if it's one specific city, what Uber and Lyft are looking at is specific routes that they've mapped yep. really well. So there are ways you can break down the problem, and that is a classic engineering solution to it solve is, a it's, hard uh, it's, it's even more classic in AI, isn't it? Restrict the domain, make the problem easier. Yep. So we've seen Drive AI doing this, we've seen people doing it on campuses. So I want to ask all of you about this, because um, on the one hand, that's the obvious way to do it. Business parks, start there, then increase to these you know, canonical routes in big, easy American cities with lots of sunshine, no snow, and grid systems, mm -hmm. and then try and avoid turning left, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yep. So I can see ways you can simplify it, but then you combine that with Europe, which has like medieval street layouts and you know it's a complete nightmare. And then we have apparently roundabouts make like London the worst place in the world to have an autonomous car. So how do you how can you do that simplify things in a in a part of the world where everything is just like it automatically much harder to start with? I'd like to hear from all of you on that. Well I, I'd say it's a good thing. Um, yeah so um, anything that keeps the uh, competitor companies out of Europe for the moment is a good thing. Because they're scared uh, of roundabouts, basically. They're, they're like scared of roundabouts. What's that? <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, so, we, uh, so, so if, you, if, you, if you go anywhere near our proving ground and we, all the villages around there, you'll see our cars you know, being tested on roundabouts on a fairly continuous basis. Uh, did you and have to repaint all the lines or anything like not that? Not at all, no. No, okay, excellent, all. excellent. No, no, we've got uh, very good sort of prediction algorithms in there. So if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, is basically what you <laughs> In the words of the song, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but, but, I mean, there are definitely some big challenges here in Europe. I mean, y you are absolutely right. The lighting is worse. Um, it, it rains a lot. Um, you know, the, it, even you look up to the skies and you know, big parts of the sky, no satellite ever crosses, um, which is going to make it much harder for localization. So you have to apply much more advanced algorithms to solving those kind of problems. Um, and um, so, so I, think, I think in some ways that is good because it does mean that U.S. companies and Chinese companies are the other main parts of the world that are focused on this space um, are going to knuckle down and punch all the way through in their home markets and they're going to take some time to decide that they'd prefer to do that in London. Um, so you know, so that, that it, it does create an opportunity, I think, right. for us to build businesses and capabilities here and also to kind of grow and to curate and to have available to us a whole corpus of data that is relevant to our cities here that other people don't have. Um, so I think that's okay. a kind of key thing. What do, what, do, what do you two think about um, 
this trade-off about I mean, in Europe, I mean, presumably cyclists, you hardly get any cyclists in America, do you? But I mean, somewhere like Holland, you've got nothing but cyclists. So um, th presumably that's an opportunity for a company like you. For sure. And um, one, one really interesting thing that we found working in different geographies, so we work in Japan, Germany, and the US, is that you can't use the same software in the same place. Because people, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example, just hailing a taxi. Yeah. In Mongolia, you hail a taxi like this. Whereas in London, you, you, you do this probably. In Korea, you do this. So if you put that same software in a different country, it's just not going to recognize what the people are doing. And, and your systems need to recognize that the difference between a UPS truck and a school bus and how they behave and that kind of stuff too. So there is a lot of this uh, local specific stuff. Presumably you can help people by simulating like what... Yeah, exactly so. So we actually um, learn our behaviours. So we use machine learning to build these behaviour models based on traffic camera data and also drone data as well. So we collect data that's really local. So it can show you how people drive in London, how people drive in San Francisco, highways in the US, China and so forth. So you can actually create very local behaviours because exactly as we were talking about, there, there are different driving styles across the world, different ways people think about crossing roads, different habits whether you will cross a road in front of a car and expect it to stop or not. Right. And uh, cyclists, as you said, in Amsterdam, much more aggressive than they are anywhere else in the world. I didn't and you use really the word aggressive, but uh, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> so, so excellent. Now, you mentioned China for the first time, so I wanted to um, uh, where, see where you all stand on China, because they're, they're essentially the US model, as I understand it, is try to get the cars to work with other drivers with the existing infrastructure. So it's an infrastructure light model. Europe is an infrastructure light model, only it's a nightmare because of roundabouts and like medieval cities and so on. And then China is like, no, we're going to just like close this third of the city to all vehicles except autonomous cars. We're going to repaint all the roads. We're going to stick a whole load of infrastructure in so that like the, you know, they can all tell where they are. And so it's a much more infrastructure heavy approach. Is that roughly right? Are, are any of you playing in the infrastructure heavy China version of this world? Uh, well, we, we, we definitely think there's a role for infrastructure here. Um, so some? Some role, uh, yeah. How um, much is enough? Uh, I, don't think we, I don't think we know. I don't think anybody knows, to be honest. Um, but I think, uh, I think anything that can improve the performance and safety of the system, we would definitely like. Um, so, you know, so, for example, our cars have got many, many more sensors than other vehicles have. You know, with, with orthogonal or, or near orthogonal sensing modalities around a car. Um, and the same would be true for infrastructure. So if, for example, we can get every traffic light to broadcast its state, um, then it, it's, it's another sensing mode. So when you're uh, coming up to a, red, a green light, you can tell if it's about to go red and you can start braking. You could do that, yeah. So I I mean, obviously, we, we train all our detectors to be able to do that with very high precision, very high recall anyway. But, but very, very high might not be good enough. Um, well, I can see that traffic light is the first thing you add, and they've just done this in Las Vegas along yeah. the Strip so that they right. can have a self-driving shuttle. Um, and I can also see that at the other end, you can have like air traffic control systems for roundabouts, so you give people slots, and when the car arrives at the roundabout, it's, it, the slot is ready for it. And, and I can see that's really complicated. What's in the middle? What else can you... Well, I think... I what think comes you after you the traffic light? You could, for example, imagine having cameras every 100 metres, um, so that, you know, you know the, the part, of the part, part of the trouble for self-driving is objects that are in the distance that um, yeah, maybe they... You don't know what they are, uh, right, so I can You don't see know what they are, you've only got a few pixels to classify them, and they're doing 70 miles an hour towards you, or, uh, obviously not in a city 70 miles an hour, but the closing, the closing velocity between the, you and that vehicle could certainly be 40 miles an hour, and, and if you're sampling at 30 frames a second and you've only got, I don't know, eight megapixels or something, um, then yeah, there's a certain time frame to better sort of uh, classify and recognize that vehicle. Um, so, so anything that can, you can do that will improve your perception in the distance is, is a good thing. Um, and the same would be true of very difficult junctions where you've got blind corners or you've got like a big bus. Yeah, the cars can, can see round corners. Now this is, um, the, w the f funny thing is people say, oh, we, we're going to need 5G to do um, the autonomous cars, except that it tends to be the vendors of 5G networking gear who say this. And when people say, what are we going to use 5G for? Isn't it just 4G any faster? They go, no, no, we're going to need it for the autonomous car. Yeah, definitely. Whereas you talk to most autonomous car people, they'll go, if the, net if the car needs a 5G network to work, we're screwed because, you know, you can't even get 3G. And I was I, getting I edge I out here just now. I, so think, I think that's completely right, Tom. Yeah. I, I, I think it is. So it's um, nice to have, but you've got to be able to cope I, without I think, it. I think if you can get more reliable wireless connectivity, then definitely, for sure. It's right. definitely helpful. Um, but, I mean, the, the previous business I did, we made chipsets for cell phones, you know, 2G, 3G, LTE modem chips. 
And uh, yeah, I probably spent more time than I'd like to uh, remember explaining to customers why there was a radio link failure on a particular test case in some corner of a roundabout in Shanghai um, because of some you know, shadowing problem or whatever. And I wouldn't like my self-driving car to, to stop be working. dependent on that. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Um, right, I want to ask you all about overlooked human factors because we talked about the brains of the car, the infrastructure, the simulation, putting all these point solutions together and so on. There's some really basic stuff we haven't figured out. Like, you know, when you called an Uber, the, uh, the guy in the Prius shows up and, he, um, and he, he can kind of figure out where's an annoying place to stop and where isn't. And, you know, if you take a bit too long to get in the car, everyone else is beeping. And he's like, come on, hurry up. So how's this going to work? I haven't seen how, how are we going to deal with this? I mean, these autonomous cars, are we just going to need bus stops for autonomous cars? I mean, there's basic kind of user experience stuff that just hasn't seemed to have been figured out yet. So tell me how that's going to work. Well, so... so just to get back to the previous question uh, first is, I feel like it's not only a technological choice, but also a social choice. Right. How do you actually want the city to be, and how do you want people to be able to move through that city? And how much are we going to redesign the streets to make all this work? And how much of it's just going to be... Exactly. Yeah. So where do you think we strike that balance? Well, we're trying to push a, a, a people-first agenda where it's about the people that live in the city that should be able to move freely through that city without being bordered by like fences or by you can see it like stoplights. A, this dystopian future yeah, exactly. where actually humans are thrown off the roads and that's i think something that we're very we live in that we live avoid. in that present right now that was what happened in the 1920s right so how do we how do we because cars were kind of done to us right the last time around the industry kind of said we're going to do it this way this time around we've we've seen that movie before so we can choose what kind of autonomous future we want i'm sure we'll get different versions but what do you who's doing this right what does a nice environment for these cars look like where they can still move but we aren't kind of terrified they're going to squash us I mean, I think that's partly where it's so important to make sure that you've proven the cars are safe and you've actually got that understanding of what how humans, particularly pedestrians, cyclists, vulnerable road users, are going to behave around that self-driving car. Because the reason why this dystopian future would happen where actually the humans are thrown off the roads is because the problem might become too hard. I think there might be some things we also need to simplify again. So, for example, there are a lot of unwritten rules that we have as humans, you know, negotiating around the road. And I'd really honestly encourage you, next time you're just walking as a pedestrian, notice what it's like when you cross the road in front of a car. And you'll be like, you know, you'll be looking at And you know they've seen you, you and they nod. And, yeah. and I would never really notice that until I started doing this job. and was like, oh, my yeah. God. So actually, I think some of those things will need to be codified a bit more than they are because it's possible that it's going to become too hard to solve. So, right, so we, in other words, one of the ways you can get around this is you can kind of label the autonomous cars, really, you know, Drive AI does this with like, the orange, so people have different expectations of them. In the same way you have different expectations of school buses or UPS vans, is that, an, is that a good I, idea? I think that's a very good idea. Yeah, so, I mean, our cars are like bright blue, you, you very, very hard to miss them. Because um, this uh, is kind of a Turing test thing, isn't it? We're not really trying to build a car that can fool someone else into thinking it's got a human driver. We just, I mean, it's perfectly all right for it to admit that it's a robot car I, I and everyone goes, right. oh, it's a robot. And, 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 and it, may be, you know, it, it may be initially these, these cars operate in like bus rapid transit lanes or something. Right. So that's an obvious uh, good place to start. Um, but when in mixed traffic, it may be they have to go slow and everyone realizes it's a slightly lumbering vehicle. And maybe we've got to put like big um, bumpers all the way around it and, uh, and in a bright orange color or People something. People get really annoyed when cars obey the law, don't they? <laughs> I mean, they've had this problem in Chandler that the cars are all, the self-driving cars are all actually obeying the law and everyone goes, oh, hurry up, get hurry on up. with it. And, and that's actually been one of the challenges I think people didn't realize that actually yeah. the original in thought was if as long as you build a totally safe self-driving car that always behaves, uh, follows the rules, that will be fine. Yeah. Not really understanding that actually a lot of human driving doesn't quite look like that. Most human drivers speed, we're a bit aggressive, you know, we don't quite stick to the rules and people expect that. Yeah. But it's the same with people as well. Yeah. Like people don't follow the where where to cross in a zebra, or especially in London, don't follow when they're allowed to cross. So these vehicles should be able to understand that that happens as well and adapt to it. But so they say in Japan, people even in the middle of the night in a deserted town, they'll wait for the ma man to go green before they. Is this true? Yeah. You've heard this one? Okay, so yeah, not well we see it in the data. Okay, fine. Um, I think we've got about two minutes left. So I just I just want to ask you how how do you how do you all see this playing out? What is this, what is the path to wider deployment in the next couple of years? Is it going to be more kind of campus level? What's it going to be? Well, it's, it's not going to be legal to offer uh, fully autonomous services in European cities till, I, I mean, you, you have to ask the government really, but I mean, you know, probably best case 22 or 23 in, in the UK, potentially as a starting country. 
Um, and it's not going to be wide scale across European cities till the middle of the next decade. So it's not honestly going to be as quick as, um, as, as people might like it to be. But, but actually, in some ways, that's fortunate because the technology is not quite ready either. Um, so we've got, we've got some work to do to get to that point. Um, uh, but, but I think it will begin to launch in some you know, quite tightly defined operational design domains um, in the kind of you know, middle of the first half of the next decade. Uh, with some launch services that, that probably I I in very, very dark conditions or rainy conditions or snow or something, maybe they don't operate um, right. and other conditions they do. But it's going to start cautiously and then we're going to build trust. And Where would you bet first? China, Singapore? Um, I, well, certainly China. Um, I'm not sure about Singapore. I know there's lots of trials going on in Singapore. They're building that new business district that's apparently yeah. going to be autonomous cars okay. only. Yeah, so they've okay. I think they've committed to early 2020s. Right. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, maybe bits of the states. I mean, you know, Waymo will eventually launch in Phoenix with something. Um, so we're not quite sure what and how extensive it's going to be. Um, and then we'll see one or two companies after that. Yeah, m yeah, maybe we'll see Cruise launch something yeah, one or two years after that. So, so it's going to be very, very patchy. It's definitely route by route, block by block, city by city. It definitely gets built bottom up. It's, it's definitely not top down. Uh, and we'll see the same happening in Europe um, in, 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 in similar sort of controlled ways. What, what, I th what I think tends to be forgotten is that these technologies are already valuable now, and you can already use them in advanced driver assistance yep. systems, in smart infrastructure. So I don't feel like it's going to be this aha moment, suddenly everywhere is autonomous cars, but the technology is fading in. Of, of yeah. Yeah. And as soon as they're ready to a certain level, they'll be used in current day products so that they're already in use, and then eventually they'll be fully autonomous. Or do you, do you have a kind of, would you bet on a particular market first? So I think there's actually th sort of three streams of, w of activity that we'll see. So us as consumers will see uh, increasing automation in our passenger cars. And actually, I think about two thirds of new cars sold in the UK every year have got some form of automated feature now. And that's going to start becoming legislated in new cars, things like emergency braking and so forth, which do have a big impact on safety. We will see these kind of shared taxi sort of autonomous sh shuttle type solutions. And then the one thing we haven't mentioned previously is um, autonomous trucking. Right. So there's a really exciting, very clear business case for um, autonomous trucks going long distances where you can um, actually, it's fairly simple to do that kind of driving. Is that platooning with a human at the front or is it? It can be or it can be without the platoon purely autonomous. There's a really good business case for that. And actually there's a real need for it because we have a worldwide shortage of truck drivers. Uh, it's also, you know, it's, it's a hard job to do. Well, it's a horrible so job because you're away from home a lot. So if you make it, if you make the local last mile. Hub and spoke, exactly. Right. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Okay, have we run out of time? There's someone waving at me. Yeah, two minutes. Okay, well in that case, let me ask you all this question. There is, a, there is a bit of a debate about whether highway driving with trucks is actually easier or not. And the case for it is, well, it's a controlled environment, it's a highway, you know, you get fewer weird edge cases. And the, and, but the case against is, yeah, but when you do have, like, someone stops their car in the middle of the highway and then gets out and then there's a sheep on the road and uh, you're barreling along and you weigh, you know, 50 tonnes, the consequences of being wrong are, are really, really bad. It's very hard to stop. So um, I've heard people argue it both ways, but they don't actually think this is any simpler. Do any of do you all, are you all of one mind that actually trucking is easier than uh, urban driving? I, I, I think it must be much easier. Um, yeah, so based on you know, the, the work that we do, I mean, the state space that the um, urban situation could be in is massive. Um, so the, the need to go and capture that and to um, uh, simulate it and to have a runtime stack that can generalize and deal with it is massive. And the verification process behind it is huge as well. So, so, so I think the, by contrast, in a trucking situation on the highway, you might only care about five or six things around you. Everything around you is metal, probably. Um, the rules are fairly straightforward um, to learn, and it, you, know, you can sort of imagine, you, you're, you're right, there is a product here about you know, the consequence of making a mistake times the frequency equals the cost, yep. really. Um, but the, the frequency is going to be substantially lower, I think. Um, so that I think it's come out ahead. an easier problem. What about this? Because you're supposed to not have pedestrians on highways, but exactly. are they, you know, is it useful to be able to detect them and their intent anyway? Well, I think in terms of like distance to a truck, you just need a longer braking distance. So if you can perceive further in the distance, you'll be able to adapt faster. So that's a sensor problem. But in terms of perception in a city, there's so much stuff that's happening. And I think that's essential to 
working autonomous applications, it means that they should be super diverse in terms of their understanding of what happens, what types of people walk through cities, what happens when a tree falls over, how does that look like? There's so much stuff that happens that doesn't really happen on an empty highway through Arizona. Okay, well, thank you all for that tour of the state of self-driving. Stan Boland, Leslie Notabome, and Kirsty Lloyd-Dukes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.